Even since before I started talking on here about all sorts of weird, obscure, and niche oddities, my interests have always led me, time and time again, to one specific sentence. Style over substance. A phrase that many people, even well-meaning ones, use to describe a lot of art that don't particularly fit with their respective genres, or even with said folks' preconceived ideas or definition of what they expect from them in the first place. And not that I take big offense to that, but personally, I don't really see eye to eye with that notion or criticism of art. I've said it before plenty of times and I'm sure others have done too before me, but I've always thought that style is substance. Never in an overly preachy way, but in one that denotes that stuff like art direction, stylistic decisions, narrative inclinations, and all sorts of other small details are just as pivotal to the full experience as gameplay with a capital G. Maybe even more so for me. It's entirely because of that sentiment that I even started making videos in the first place. Always more concerned about presenting vibes and feelings over what some would consider hard facts and huge quotation marks. And despite some bumps along the road, all that good stuff is what ended up making me want to talk about things like how Yumeniki's emphasis on exploration and its seemingly lack of traditional narrative only benefits its creatively strange set pieces with vibes that are to this day completely unmatched, or how Planet Laika's weirdly unconventional storytelling in the manner of abstract flashbacks and hallucinations haunting you across the entire game complements perfectly its overly complex dwelling into the conditions of the human psyche, dogface included. The whole idea that style is intrinsically intertwined with substance has kinda always been the tagline for this channel. Yet it's only recently, through putting it to words through videos and talking about it with other folks who feel similarly, that I realized just how important it was. And putting it like that, it kinda makes sense in retrospect. It's never been by way of gameplay alone that I get to playing said games, but more so about how it manages to connect with all of its other elements. It's art style, setting, narrative choices, how it looks, how it feels in a more abstract type beat. Not to say that gameplay isn't important, but it's definitely because of those non-gameplay elements and how gameplay ties into them that stuff gets style in. Because in the end, both style and substance acting in tandem is what pushed me to experiment with all sorts of different genres, constantly trying to break the mold to see what's hidden in every corner of a landscape that'll never stop growing. So with all that inspirational speech aside, I think it's finally time we talk about why style is substance, in the only way that truly felt fitting to me, directly peeking into the full-on kaleidoscopic lens that is this unique pair of games, a duo that wears boldly those feelings on their blackened leather sleeves. Welcome to the world of Hylix. Another video, another intro. One about a classic from the RPG Maker scene, no less. Apple of my eye, beloved child, and coming from the engine responsible for a ton of my teenage nostalgia. Bit obvious at this point with the sheer amount of times it's cropped up on the channel, but weren't it all the same. I mean, damn dog, if there ain't any other game that gives me that same sort of feeling. Hylix, in all of its multimedia beauty, continues perfectly RPG Maker's lineage of cool as fuck projects. From the late 90s with its Japanese underground scene filled to the absolute brim with all sorts of obscure, inspirational, and experimental shit, to the early and mid-2000s respectively, with back-to-back -back cult classics that would still to this day influence tons amongst others, all the way to today with wave after wave of new creators, each at the helm of their own definition and perception of this entire cycle of creation. Whatever emotionally charged aesthetical playground they'll end up making, will in turn turn more eyes towards a scene that deserves more love than it gets. I just love being able to see so many folks throughout so many years and each of their own interpretations on what they consider to be important in video games, let alone in art. Always stretching the absolute limits of that engine though, both narratively, gameplayingly, but especially technically. Since well, if we talk purely technical, the whole thing seems to be held in place exclusively by the sheer coding mastery of a ton of sticks and tape. Cause yeah, as much as I love RPG Maker for the games that spawn from it, knowing the technical limitations going on behind the whole deal really makes you wonder what sort of occult wizardry some of those devs be channeling. Especially when it comes to games like Hylix, that decide to completely ditch modern conventions in favor of graphical art styles using all sorts of unconventional mixed media tones. It's stuff that ends up really making it shine, truly being itself in more ways than one too. It's led to some genuinely forward-thinking stuff on a budget of an empty cup of coffee and lots of blood, sweat, and tears. And you know what? 
I'll drink to that happily, because I too live vicariously through weirdly motivational artistry, which Hylix simply exudes, you know? Funky backgrounds, stylish claymation art, ambient-sounding soundtrack, and vibes for days. It's got that good shit hitting on all cylinders, you feel? And I know, I know, long time coming for this one, but what can I say? I just love teasing that shit in all sorts of other vids, slowly sowing the seeds that would eventually germinate into this very video. Kinda makes it feel even more special now, and rightfully so. Even though, to be completely honest with you, the big reason why it took so long is that it's hella intimidating. The same thing I said about Yume Nikki like a year ago still applies today. Talking about a game that not only had a huge cultural impact amongst its scene, but also one that directly influenced me and all of my own stylistic endeavors, could have easily become the stuff of nightmares. Every minute detail devolves rapidly into an abyss of information that you can't help but spiral into, sliding in deeper and deeper as you take more and more notes, always trying to make sure that your vid's gonna be the one, all complete, prim and proper, and that you won't forget anything. And while maybe a year ago I would have been the one to stress over that stuff, this time, it's different. Ain't no sense in overthinking it. Cause in the end, all I can really offer you, per usual, is my thoughts and feelings. And good thing, cause I got a ton of those to spare. Hylix is just one of those really special games that refuse to leave my mind even years after playing it. Part parody of old school RPGs, part interactive journey to an artistic gallery, but 100% Mara core in its stylish attitude. Its world perfectly embraces its own abstraction while sporting the freshest art direction you'll see on this side of the flesh galaxy. Created by the one and only claymation god Mason Lindroth, Hylix made its own spot as one of RPG Maker's finest and most unique projects to this day. It tackles head-on the rhetorical question that every basic bitch boy gamer regurgitates, all nose in the air like, can games be art? and proceed to slap the ever-living shit out of them for even suggesting that they weren't right from the start. The game's plot is just this weird and imaginative look into the surreal, based entirely on the randomness of each poetic NPC laid out, out there waiting for you to find out. And in part, some of that obtuseness is what makes Hylix everything that it is, like an absurdist painting, a piece of art you can't help but stare into. It's got chaotic energy, positive connotation. I mean, right from the start, you're greeted up with the lore dump of the century, courtesy of some funky scenery and poetic dialogue, both of which look absolutely stylish as all hell, while also meaning absolutely nothing in the long run. And honestly, that's kinda in line with a ton of other RPGs out there. While the narrative, story threads, and party interactions are engaging, the usual intro lore dumps you tend to get in that sort of game kinda do be just that. Exposition. Your typical background stories serve their purpose and all. They provide you with enough information to really get you up to speed, offering you that semblance of already having been there without having to stomach the overlongest of setups. The tone of the story, who you are, what your role in the world is, what said world is even all about. It's all good, but it's also all lore. And by all means, lore can be cool as fuck. There's plenty of games that benefit greatly from having that sort of exposition hidden in every corner, so that way you too can end up piecing the world together, one note at a time. Though in its initial absence, or rather purposeful obfuscation, Hylix demands out of you exactly that, to just go out there and figure it out by yourself, completely unassisted and unrestrained. And while trying to find the meaning in that abstraction, you travel from eclectic backdrop to eccentric scenery, never too sure what could pop up right in front of you. That opening monologue serves that same self-purpose, just like how Moon pulls your leg with the extra-long exposition, taking shape of a text you can't fully read because it gets progressively longer and faster, Hylix does the same with its NPC's funky gibberish. It felt to me like it was going for this purposeful parody of what you'd expect to see in your stereotypical RPG setup, almost as if the game itself was telling you that all this stuff is just fluff, that in the end you better get a move on instead, and that, in and of itself, makes it hella charming to me. Because when it comes down to the game's actual story, stripped of its convoluted contrivances, conveniences, and conventions, you're kind of left with the story of pretty much any role-playing game. One that you could have already played, even. You embody the protag, a stylish one at that, that goes by the name of Wayne, but effectively one of many faces, who goes on a quest to kill some tyrannical god, this time the megalomaniac Gibby, who just so happens to threaten the balance of your world. This isn't new. As a matter of fact, you could probably trace that shit even further back than video games themselves. Yet the way Hylix presents itself, it makes it feel so fresh and unique. 
standing out with their vibes, visuals, and feelings, like nothing else I'd experienced at the time. Beyond the abstract intro though, you're kind of left there on your own to guide Wayne where he's supposed to go, wherever that may be. The more you travel, the more NPCs will point you towards increasingly strange and stranger locations, across a world map that purposely mimics the setup of old-school, retro-as-fuck feeling RPGs. And true to its origins, you do what your heroes of yore be doing. Gotta explore hella dungeons, scavenge a ton of items, and most importantly, meet some other folks who are willing to back you up in dethroning that asshole Gibby, sitting almighty on his throne on the moon. That's something I really fuck with when it comes to Hylix. The game is spoon feeds you party members one after the other, except it never really hands them to you. The whole thing's fairly open-ended, and you can easily miss out on the three additional fuckos who'll be joining you if you don't got an eye for exploration. And honestly, the game kinda expects that from the get-go. They constantly shove enemies in your face that won't shy away from bodying you if you're going solo. It wants you to explore, to find some homies, and legit, by the end, your entire party's filled up with the grooviest members of all time, each of them bringing their own spice to the fight, pre-packaged with their own Vegas fuck archetypes, and of course, personalities. Like when you meet Somnosa, the master of all bugs, lounging at her place mad casual, as if she was just waiting for you to show up eventually. Or how you gotta help out the homie de Dustmalm in his archaeological findings, in the hopes of uncovering some forbidden artifact taking the shape of a pristine paper cup. Or even how you meet the aggro as fuck Pangorma and have to forcefully make him chill out through hand-to-hand -hand combat in order for him to join you in the first place. And even though that might sound esoteric as all hell for some, this is pretty much your typical video gamey vibe. There's always new recruitable folks out there, an endless supply of cozy towns to visit, optional dungeons to explore, and all manner of gear to collect before you can really see yourself heading off into the distance gestures memorized, inventory packed with stuff of various nebulous descriptions, but perfectly equipped to turn the big bad inside out. Though, you know, I don't think I'd be exaggerating by saying that combat in this type of game, especially ones made in RPG Maker, tend to get pretty divisive amongst folks. If it's even there in the first place, it's usually just to get you from one point to another, and that usually works out pretty alright, but it's only really through creative usage and titles that decided to really go out there with it that we've seen some stuff that doesn't immediately feel pretty default. Systems that either fully utilize this lack of option by making combat narrative-driven, or mechanics that completely defy the norms of the genre. And honestly, despite that, Hylix really emphasizes that issue in this weird, almost liberating way. By the time of its release, I had played what most folks would consider your mid-to-late aughts cult classics, the Yumenikis, offs and space funerals of our world but I had never seen a game that looked or felt exactly like Hylix. And even though that's usually because of its art, it's also in part due to its subversion of combat tropes. Even though it relies on the admittedly pretty bog standard setup of four guys in a row, it's done in such a way that it felt fresh the entire time. On more than just a kinesthetic level, Hylix absolutely fucks. Plus, the whole combat system is handled so effectively that practically anyone who's ever played an RPG before will find themselves comfortable pretty early on. Though it also never shies away from fucking around with pre-established conventions on the way there either. For one, battles are kept relatively simple. Here's your enemies, your arbitrary stats in the shape of flesh and will, both replacing HP and whatever resources games use nowadays. Get slapping. Its turn-based action is pretty fast-paced, and it never wastes time by telling you exactly what you need to do. You're kinda expected to just roll with it, and I find a lot of enjoyment from that liberty. The moment you bust into a fight, your life's on the line as much as the swarms of bizarre enemies, each turn bringing you closer to either death or victory, simple as. The replacement for your average magic system also innovates bigly. Your party of four local goons learn new abilities by interacting with TVs hidden around the world map each of them giving you unique spells in the shape of those really cool digitized claymation bits. Every new technique sporting those same flashy animations in combat. And the more you go, the funkier they get over time. It legit never gets old. Like even your basic attack has this really slick look to it, finger snapping your way into pure damage dealing, and it doesn't stop at that. I mean, just look at those glyphs dancing all over the screen, the space shurikens being chucked around, the dark flames materializing ominously, or even an actual, factual nuclear blast. It fucking rules! 
Some folks might see the weird name stapled on a lot of that stuff you'll find across the game and kind of wince, thinking it's going to be a pain in the ass to parse, but really, it's super easy to pick up. Your equipments might range from unloaded guns with no bullets to find to a wacky arrangement of various gloves, each of them boosting stats that make absolutely no sense at first glance, but that's kind of the fun of it. Despite its layers and layers of abstraction, Hylix is a game about games, about their conventions, their tropes, all the stuff that makes them themselves. And it's being felt majorly in that regard. Finding paper cups stashed around that only one party member can use to boost your stats, or toilet burritos to feed off of in the middle of your next slap fight. It's all good stuff that pokes fun at how odd some of the more video gamey tropes can be. Never in a way that ridicules or overtakes them, but in one that encourage you not to think too much about it to instead embrace that weirdo wackiness. And while I usually wouldn't go into a full-on in-depth mechanical analysis, because it's not exactly the stuff I want to focus on, the game's got way too many interesting systems complementing all that stuff to not at least mention them. Like the whole cycle of death and rebirth, for example. Usually dying in games would boot you back to your last save or something, but here it's entirely written to the story. Whenever your ass gets handed to you, the very clay that forms Wayne's body just melts away in this super cool animation, and you're just sent over to another place called the afterlife. This zone, which is complete with fish out of water advice, teleporters to get you back where you were at, and even an option to power yourself up. Each death comes with little to no penalty, besides the time you've lost. And really, that's made up entirely by the fact that enemies don't respawn once you've killed them. So no random encounter is cock blocking you on the way there either. The entire experience feels seamless as fuck, and kind of teaches you to expect death, though never at your own expense. Instead, it kind of becomes this necessary step throughout the game's duration. Whenever you defeat an enemy, they'll drop ominously titled meat, which you can use in the afterlife to increase your party's flesh. This ties perfectly into one of my favorite aspects from Hylix, the actual, factual lack of grind. After collecting meat from all over the place, you're often incentivized to return to the afterlife to chuck it down the grinder and increase your whole party's HP, allowing you some time to prepare for the game's stronger enemies. The very act of grinding that meat down to level up isn't just for namesake either, but instead acts as the whole joke in and of itself. You know, in your old school RPGs, you'd have to come in, come out of zones, slap on your best equips to make sure you can farm in peace always making sure you've got the right chops before even considering taking on the next boss. But here, none of that. Enemies are finite. Meat itself is finite. So levels are too. In that way, grinding's completely negated. When you end up clearing a map out of enemies, it's almost as if the game itself is expecting you to have moved on already. It's some real powerful shit that prevents it from ever feeling like a slog. Though that being said, the combat's not exactly perfect either. At least, I don't think it is, nor do I think it even should be. Some of the later fight defo teeters on the edge of turn your brain off while your team spams your most powerful moves, but that's both nitpicky as fuck and hella subjective. The gameplay, unobtrusive as it was to me, complements the art direction beautifully. So much so, in fact, that I didn't mind the rough edges, because it never failed to present some cool concepts, ideas, novel stuff that kept the playthroughs feeling fresh every time. It's entrancing in a way I can't really explain. The world sells itself so well that the randomness, the abstraction, never feels too on the nose either. Hylix never outstayed its welcome. It felt as if it came into my life and left before I could even notice just how impactful it was. Just as suddenly as the snap of Wayne's fingers. I remember finishing Hylix and thinking to myself, in the infinite wisdom of being fucking 20 years old at the time, if I'd ever get to experience another game like this. Something that would change my perception of the medium as a whole. That would use an art style this stylish. Something that would connect with me like that. And for a long time, I genuinely wasn't sure I would. And I mean, I've proven myself wrong plenty of times. Just look at this whole channel. It's filled to the brim with stuff that's clearly impacted me in some way, shape, or form. I ended up playing tons of stuff between then and now. Started fucking around with some more obscure titles. Shit that never released here or had dubious reputations. You know the stuff that folks talked about in hushed tones, like, Hey, psst, you know that one LSD game? Well, that guy apparently made another one, but no one's ever found it. Plenty of great stuff, but still. In the back of my mind, I always wondered, would something like Hylix appear again? 
Was it just this once-in-a-lifetime situation that I was lucky enough to experience at the right place, at the right time? Until one day, in the summer of 2020, where suddenly... Hilux fucking two, baby! Hell yeah! From the moment it got announced all the way till release, there wasn't a day that passed without my brain clamoring to see Wayne's beauty in all of its 3D CG. I mean, damn, the first game was hella cool, but this... This was something else entirely. Just look at those colors, those vibes, that beautiful mix of CGI, rotoscoping, and claymation. It still retained the same charm as the original, while also managing to elevate it beyond fuck, shedding the shackles of RPG Maker's vague technical limitations in favor of using Unity. Mason Lindroff just straight up, back to back, made two of the coolest games we'll ever know. Hylix 2 isn't just a sequel, but a full-on reinvention of what made the first one so iconic in the first place. The game opens up on this really stylish cinematic, like nothing else you'd expect, where this floating, abstract clay object ominously unpeels in the void of your mind, creating what seems to be like this weird Wayne-Larva hybrid, only for said Wayne to wake up in bed, in this new room, swanky as fuck and ready to go. Just from that scene alone, you can tell that what the game has to offer is a whole lot different from its predecessor, and I vibe hard with that. One of the most interesting features coming from Hylix had always been its visuals. Even just the way you interacted with its world was straight up fascinating. Almost every object could be fucked around with, examined, not always granting the best of results, but still offering you some cool animation as a reward. Trees handing you vegetables as they curl back into the ground, sandcastles you could build, or trash cans you could smash. In Hylix 2, this sort of motion is taken even further, with all of its world sharing that same sort of vibrant, vibing animation. The way Wayne strolls around all casual, the scenery and its fever dreamlike color eye candy with mellow yellows, pinks pastel as hell, and blues that chuck and fuck, complementing each other perfectly. The enemies constantly dipping and dancing to the rhythm of the banging soundtrack. The backgrounds coming in, coming out, pulsating in the distance. The first person perspective switch into a maze-like dungeon crawler. The side-scrolling platformer segments completely blindsiding you with their retro goodness. The act of exploration and the way you see Wayne and the homies, dashing effortlessly through the air with their fancy twirl, floating down those clay mountains, traveling from island to island. It's genuinely breathtaking. They straight up couldn't have nailed the transition from 2D to 3D any better. Cause yeah, even though the characters are still digitized sprites, the world itself is fully three-dimensional. And man does it help to really sell the aesthetic of it, actively acting as this grandiose full-on return to form, remodeling the clay-like world into a reimagining of itself. Similarly, when it comes down to the story, you play once more as Wayne and his lovable party of fuck freaks, still sporting the coolest of designs, but this time taken even further, going on about their days since the end of the first. Hylix sees our cast spread out, living the best of their lives until some cultist asshole decide to ruin the fun and resurrect Gibby, causing more havoc in the meantime. It feels oddly straight to the point throughout all of its obtuseness, in a similar way to the first game. You know right from the start what you need to do. Get the gang back together, slap some gloves on and go fuck shit up. And it's still a whole lot of fun. Despite the world shedding a bit of its abstraction and translation, in favor of NPCs that speak actual semi-comprehensible words for once, it still channels that good stuff in a more organized manner, a method to the chaos if you will, that reflects really well the changing tides of time since last game's finale. Same thing goes for the gameplay. No backtracking, no min-maxing, just that pure weirdness in a way that feels right at home. It takes the same RPG setup it used so well and managed to iterate on it in a way that makes it feel entirely new without changing too much. You're still using all sorts of cool as fuck techniques, spanning from weird clay formations embodying pure vengeance, to status effects to kiss the homies goodnight. I mean, just look at this shit. Pongorma's lightning just blasting enemies away with this jerky, powerful hand motion. Somnosa channeling a wave of damage with some smooth hand movements rocking back and forth. It makes each combat feel amazing. 
You're facing all sorts of atrocities back to back, but the world is styling twice as much around you the entire time you're dispatching. And don't hesitate to push your shit in either. This time around, ain't no way you're gonna coast the entire game with just dark flame and a couple of heals. Oh hell no. Here, you gotta slap those status effects around. Buff up and reap the benefits of a combat system that asks of you to think ahead and interact with it. The game really encourages you to dish out those techniques a lot more than before too. None of that keep the good spells for the boss type of restrained ass gameplay. Go all out, fuck them boys up, cause you never know what each fight brings ahead of time. Not that you can't prepare though, the game is fairly generous in that sense. It constantly offers you those little bugs across each map that you can slap around to recover some flesh and will. You can even use that same slap to get the upper hand in most fights, with one extra turn, acting as this sort of preemptive strike to anyone who feels cocky enough to approach you. I think it would have been fairly easy for me to go around the block, re-threading, retracing, and rewording everything I've said about the first game, to then apply it to the sequel. But honestly, I ain't about that life. Plus, doing that would straight up not do Hylix 2 any justice. So instead, I'd rather focus on what ended up mattering the most to me. The vibes, feeling, and meaning. It's practically impossible at this point to talk about Hylix as a whole without going on for days about its visuals. On that side alone, the game's got more than enough to offer. Cool gameplay was kind of always just a cherry on top for me. And folks, myself especially, tend to gravitate toward experiences like that, that visually catch the eye. It makes sense. It's a piece of art that advertised itself as an interactive recreational program first and a game second. With outsider art like itself, it's hard not to be struck by that shit. The visuals are as mesmerizing as its world entrancing, with a style that blends seamlessly various different artistic techniques, the clay that forms the world and its characters, the funky rotoscoped hand magic, the digital goodness enhancing the whole deal with CGI heavily textured to fit right in. It's all stuff you can find isolated throughout all manner of art directions, but that combined really allows Hylix to stand its own ground as a truly unique experience. Mason Lindroff, in all of his craft, brings a certain energy to his work. That absurdity, randomness, off-the-top stylistic decision turns the world into this malleable fever dream. I fuck with that bigly, as most of the art I choose to consume on the daily, or games I personally enjoy, tend to fuck with both style and substance. For real, seeing all the work-in-progress shots the man posts on Twitter seals the whole deal. The ingenuity, the mastery, and sheer artistry going on behind the whole process, on top of the amount of time it must take to produce these, is legit mind-blowing. You know, in a way, Hylix 2 kind of represents a good overview of what its creator sees in art, a culmination of his many previous works. Whether that be personal art projects or small forgotten game jam titles, it proceeds to use those trademark surreal spectacles in a way that really screams his name. No matter who you are, there's a big chance you could spot Hylix in a list of games out there and go, yeah, that's the one. Because yeah, there really isn't anything that looks or feels exactly quite like it. And to me, that's probably its biggest appeal. In all of its claymation diorama, one-of-a-kind Fort Wallace storytelling, pixelated digitized art moving in all manner of directions, and backgrounds that unequivocally fuck, style and substance are always working in tandem. That's what Hylix perfectly highlights and ends up representing to me. I simply enjoy walking around, taking in the world's vibes, stumbling into areas that connect to others that showcase even more unique visuals. Especially after unlocking the airship, which in and of itself is fucking amazing to be in, let alone control and fly with. Just letting the wind pass you by, cutting through the clouds, opening the world even more for your enjoyment has never felt more exciting. The scenery is always seeming so ethereal and distinct from each other. From usage of different textures, to different color palettes, to straight up perspective defying shit. Like for real, that one dungeon crawler maze segment is so fucking cool. You gotta navigate through it, solve some puzzles along the way, and that switch up really helped the game stay novel throughout its runtime. Same goes for the arcade levels that turn Arwen into this cute little micro version of himself, ready to dodge every incoming obstacle. Even if the second one was admittedly pretty fucking tough, it's hard not to smile, like, yeah, little guy. One of my favorite spots in Hylix 2 is the TV island. 
this weird landmass separated from everything else where you can find monks spread about, protecting this giant monitor. Functionally, it's where you can trade the antennas you've been gathering from defeated goons to power up one of your abilities. It's real good shit, but mechanics aside for a second, it's the atmosphere of that place that kept me here. It's such a relaxing spot amongst the fighting. Like a little safe haven for a second, and I don't know, it ended up resonating hard with me. In that way, the buzzing of that giant antenna officially confirms Hylix as a quintessentially denpa as fuck title. Same thing goes for the secret areas you can find for the Three Sages, who, once you do, reward you with one of the game's strongest attacks, the aptly named Bombo Genesis. Each of those little slices of peace showcasing spots that feel straight up out of this world, even for Hylix. It's the small things like that that matter the most. Like I just love how you can steal the limbs of the sage hanging out on the beach, they don't even react to it. While I defo came into the game with an eye almost exclusively for its style, it's not like it extends to its visuals alone. In fact, one of the huge component of said style comes from its flammable soundtrack, the OST filled with back-to-back -back bangers, and it's a crime that this shit isn't more widespread. Hylix 1, by courtesy of Mason Lindroff's musical chops, had these cool as fuck Aphex 20 sounding tracks that really made the whole deal feel mellow, down to earth in an almost alien way. It was oftentimes weird, unconventional, but felt oddly relaxing, like very low key. For Hylix 2, though, we're treated to the slickest of musical goodness composed by Chuck Salamone scratchy guitar, wavy vibes, and a sound like nothing else out there. I don't think anyone else could have been picked to compose a soundtrack so fitting of a world of incomprehension. Legit, the whole thing is crazy good. The title screen song surrounding you with its rebellious strings. Mystic cryptic in the maze really embracing the mystery of that place. And oh man, the fucking stanky ass bass at the start of Fancy Meat Computer, perfectly hyping you up right before the fight goes down. From the start till the end, it busts, nuts, comes and slaps something unreal. So much so in fact that after Hylix 2, they went on to release Moonage Lobotomy, this assembly of a couple more tracks representing each of our main cast, every song bringing in a different energy to the scene. Wayne's theme starts off pretty smooth, but gets wilder the more you listen to it, while still managing to maintain its cool the entire time. Somnosa's song seems more like a toned-down ballad, the guitar giving the impression of mimicking vocals, almost as if her voice was hidden deep in there. The dust mold in the meantime is this very chaotic piece, using more percussions, unconventional beats, and it hits the right spot for this adventure explory feel. and fucking Pongorma, reprising a lot of the more aggressive sounding songs from Hylix OSTs, but in its own way, really showing you that he ain't fucking around this time. Legit, go give it a listen, it's just that good. And that goes too for the whole ass opera album that came out a couple of weeks ago while I was writing this shit contextualizing and giving hints as to what's happening in the story through those generally beautiful vocal tracks. Like there's so much cool shit in Hylix and I'm only really scratching the surface. Because that art is a whole ass vector for feeling, meaning, and emotion. For as much as I've been talking, I've barely even mentioned the actual, factual plot and what it means in the end. While the game defo favors its purposeful sense of abstraction, it's not like it ain't giving you hints either. 
Hylek's overall narrative and its general significance might seem a little nonsensical from an outsider's point of view, but it's fairly easy to find said meaning and recurring themes if you got an eye for it. Like how it's hinted throughout the whole game that the story takes place in some far-off distant future, long after our time, with stuff like water coolers, television sets, and plenty of items you could spot nowadays, but that our resident fuckos use in unconventional ways instead. The whole place is dotted with plenty of runes, and it's mentioned here and there that there used to be an advanced civilization built by the sages, the three weirdos from earlier, and that those said weirdos and their world got destroyed by this thing called the Hylum Xylem, in an event called the Accretion, Gibby in turn turning his own Hylum Xylem into a similar weapon of mass destruction, once more trying to recreate the world of old. It's also mentioned that both him and Pongorma are old enough to have seen that previous world and witnessed it in its full glory, so it would make sense for Gibby to pine for that long-lost era. Though beyond the whole having to put a stop to his evilness's idealistic nonsense, there's a ton of other good stuff spread about. Like how the title itself ties into the Gnostic concept of Hylix. Not that I'm exactly the right person to full-on drop on your head some Wikipedia-ass lecture on the topic, but I can at least give you the gist of it and how it ties into the overall game. Basically, in Gnosticism, there's three categories of people. The Hylix, the Psychics, and the Pneumatics. Each of them respectively representing matter-bound beings, matter-dwelling souls, and the immaterial. Hylix, humanoid in their shape, were seen as doomed, too focused on the material world and their primal desires that they wouldn't go out there and seek knowledge. Meanwhile, the pneumatics, who saw themselves as higher than the rest, were trying to escape that doom via some form of quote-unquote secret knowledge, this power dichotomy effectively leading to one of Hylix's main interpretations. Our party serving as the namesake, while Gibby plays the role of the pneumatic, wanting to reshape the whole world so they too can be elevated, fully basking in his enlightenment. That same self-conflict is also associated with the passing of the lunar cycles, each of the moon's phases, with Wayne being the waning crescent, while Gibby represents the gibbous moon, kind of linking with the defeat of one to take over the other. The journey you take in both games ends up being a transformative one, not just of the self, the physical one, but also the whole world around you. In defeating Gibby in the first game, you'll notice that the NPCs have ditched the abstract speech of times past for a more coherent manner of forming sentences. Same for Wayne's home, which drastically changed from one game to another. Now with this giant creature looking oddly familiar living on top of your house, I think it'd be pretty fair to assume that this bigger Wayne is the one we've been playing in one, now become a greater being, while the one we actually play as serves as its newest incarnation each Wayne forever doomed to die in Rebirth for all of eternity, like clay you'd have to reshape over and over again. No matter how much time you spend remodeling him, he's never quite the same. Constantly winning, but never new. I also think the entire story could be seen as a thinly veiled criticism of capitalism, with the whole Gnostic shit of seeing folks who just want to live as being lesser. It could also be a metaphor for change as a whole, executed by folks who built up the courage and willpower to enact upon it. A power struggle through an unjust society where we do see that change finally take place. Cause maybe sometimes all you really need to fight back against the cruel indifference of a world controlled by a tyrant is a bunch of quirky anarchist rock stars with fucked up superpowers. The literal embodiment of the indomitable human spirit taken form just for you. And I mean shit, that's barely even half of it. There's so much left to discuss, but really all of it hinges on how you choose to personally approach it interpret it, and interact with it. I ain't here to tell you what's set in stone, because said stone is always changing, constantly fluctuating and flowing from one state to another. And maybe the joy of it is finding your own meaning, because all that stuff can be taken in a hundred different ways too. Those mysteries, obscurities, and obtuseness, all tying in thematically, but molded by your own perception and how much you want to see out of it. And while I could spin this whole thing into a message about how Gnosis, the word itself, is all about the essence of knowledge, or understanding why it's so meaningful to pursue it, I don't exactly agree with that notion either. Because despite the fun I've had from talking and theorizing about Hylix, I don't think you need to search for deeper meaning to enjoy things. Nor do I think it's necessarily shallow to go into experiences based solely on how much they appeal to you visually. The idea that knowledge, or some form of ulterior motive, has to be pursued in order to truly enjoy something is some real narc shit, and I ain't having none of that. And yet, despite that, Hylix more than abides to those two conflicting ideologies. Instead of forcing onto you one or the other, it gives you the opportunity to choose for yourself. 
not everything has innate knowledge tied to it immediately. Sometimes you gotta experience something and imbue it with your own. Not to spout some pseudo-philosophical babble, but the most Gnostic thing you could do is to ask yourself an open-ended question. Because in trying to find that answer, you come to realize that maybe there wasn't really one set in stone from the start. And as cliche as that shit may sound, maybe the meaning of it all was the journey, not the destination. All you can really do is think on it. And that act, in and of itself, makes it meaningful. Focusing exclusively on Hylix's more obtuse aspects, i.e. its random feeling text and obscure ass stories, is not giving it nearly enough credit. Like you always hear folks talking about how weird and wacky those games be, but legit, it all reeks of the most boomeresque, out of touch gamer stench, and I had one to associate with that crowd. I don't really talk about that shit too much, but I've always found it kinda wild how often the term surreal's been tossed around as some sort of blanket term to describe a shit ton of video games out there. Pretty much anything that's ever deigned to get weird with it, regardless of genre, gets that shit slapped on. And even though I personally choose to see it as a huge badge of honor, it's kinda gotten that weird stank to it. A reputation oftentimes stemming from folks who err on the side of more mainstream media. Whenever it do happen, it's usually referring to titles or piece of outsider art teetering on the edge of obscurity. And oftentimes, they tend to be relegated as being those cute, amusing curiosities that folks can pass around, or straight up get swallowed up back in the shadows until some folks 30 years down the line claims to have discovered it. Even though my ass spends as much time as I feasibly can on the daily to research that shit out and present it to you in the most stylish of ways, it's kind of sad to see a lot of that stuff get outright snobbed out there. For a medium that effectively gives artists the creative freedom of doing whatever they want, however they want, whenever they want, I feel like it's something that should be celebrated a bit more. Because to me, Hylix has always felt more like this modern day art installation, one that you can visit at any time from the comfort of your own home, something that a ton of other games I love never shied away from channeling too. And honestly, if that ain't something to strive for, I don't know what is. Its wild visuals, imaginative soundtrack and depths of lore embraces and carries forward the legacy of those sentiments in a way that forces people to look at it in all of its weirdness, but always in a positive light. I think it's definitely been one of the projects that's opened the most eyes when it comes to all sorts of curious indie fans out there. It led folks to explore an endless ocean of underloved and underrecognized art just floating out there, and that's hella inspiring. Hylix and many other weirdo indie projects have always acted as this sort of bridge between two worlds, not so different from each other, all while too looking and feeling like absolutely nothing else out there. This connection of both maybe was one from the get-go, as this world happened to be one where style has always been substance. Cause yeah, if you thought I was done with this shit, you're sorely mistaken, as I've spent way too much time hyping this shit up in every video to just use it as intro material. Legit, this whole thing kinda started off as this bland ass, by the book, straight to the point, no fun Hylix review, but really, that didn't feel right to me. Plus it wouldn't do any justice to some of my favorite games of all time. What can I say? I don't really like working within the constraints of folks' expectations, so here we are once again where style is substance. Even though it's pretty much become the tagline for this channel, I've never really gone in depth and explained why I keep chucking that sentence everywhere I go. So here I go. More and more I've started noticing how much calling something style over substance has become as empty of a criticism as saying something's pretentious. It always seemed to me to be one of those personal preferences masquerading as critiques type beat. And while obviously all manner of art, or even critique, is subjective as fuck, it's a sentence that doesn't exactly sit right with me, because it never acknowledges what it is, a personal preference. 
The reason being that style can and defo is substantial, and most folks tend to agree with that, whether they knowingly subscribe to that philosophy or not. Like, I don't know, it feels too redundant of a statement. So many games are hella upfront about being vibes and experience above anything else. And using that sort of sentence feels needlessly aggro to me. Like it assumes you know the author's intent, and I don't know if I fuck with that sort of matter-of-fact approach to experiencing art. When people say something is style over substance, it seems like they're just using that as a convoluted, roundabout way to state an opinion, that they didn't like it. And even though I think that's totally fair, it also feels to me like some low-key hater shit, like purposefully omitting important elements coming from the craft type shit, foregoing the subtleties of one's work in favor of very direct point making. For years I had to deal with folks broadly generalizing all forms of art as innately useless, even while I was actively studying it, so there ain't no way I'm letting that shit slide no more. It's legit the same reason why I never fuck with the idea of lumping all sorts of indie games together and calling them something as generic as Earthbound likes. Cause yeah, while there's devil been modern indie games taking inspo from the Mother series, I feel like the term's been overly used in a derogatory way just to make fun of the weirder games that come straight from the heart. Though, you know, it's not like that says much. After all, am I even the right person to talk about what defines a genre altogether? Who knows? And honestly, who the fuck cares? Too much energy is spent thinking about glorified labels. Like I'm never gonna stop enjoying stuff to hyper-focus on what it means to be a genre, a label, or all other sorts of contrivances. My understanding of art as a concept comes from an emotional point of view. I see it and ask myself, does it resonate with me? If yes, then we're Gucci. Well, I can defo see some folks looking at either Hylix games and calling them low effort, overly nebulous and randomized style over substance garbage, I say nay to that low IQ take and bring forward the official T, courtesy of me. Cause dog, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Style is substance, baby. In all of its wacky weirdo nonsense, Hylix in its malleable form gives shape to some truly forward-thinking art, and it'd be a shame not to celebrate it here and now. With this sort of mindset came in a wave of what I'd call vibe-based experiences. The good stuff that's always been more preoccupied about showcasing interesting visuals, novel stories, banging music, and intricate settings, rather than the purely mechanical and technical side of things. And while I've been mostly focusing on Hylix today as a prime example of that ideology, folks sure as hell didn't wait till 2015 of all times to start making and spreading that good shit. The innovation in that subgenre of subgenre has been rampant from its very inception, and it didn't necessarily come from a place of purposeful design, but rather in the novelty of its presentation, its aesthetic, and the general vibe the experience provides. Games like Yaku Yujo Dangi, that use straight up absurd looking 3D models to convey a horrifying visual novel story from the eyes of a bunch of overly imaginative children. Gabal screen that has you traveling across a microcosm of mini vignettes stringing you along into another set, each showcasing different aesthetics. Moonlight Syndrome and a whole lot of projects Sudas touched on, presenting interesting visuals that deviate from the norm, but always used to frame their stories' truly transgressive natures. Most of these examples are weird as fuck projects that unabashedly wear this shit on their sleeve. Their countercultural appeal of really managing to connect with most of the folks who choose to delve deeper. That sort of approach has effectively permeated the gaming landscape in more ways than one, not only through Japanese only obscurities, underloved cult classics, but also through tons of contemporary indie masterpieces. Each title actively being super different from each other, whether that be from gameplay design, artistic proclivities, stylistic sensibilities, or even just the era it came from. And because of games like that, we slowly started seeing it seep into other subcultures, and eventually even peeking through the mainstream. Rather than relying exclusively on industry vets, gaming journos, and all manner of quote-unquote professional folks, there's been a bigger focus on smaller sources compared to macro aggregates. YouTubers slowly became the ones most commonly associated with that sort of sphere or overall take on game design philosophies oftentimes focusing a lot less on purely contextual gameplay analysis and instead choosing to put their thoughts and feelings into words to describe the finer details of those experiences. There's a bigger emphasis on establishing and connecting with an audience of like-minded people, 
And honestly, I feel like the main big reason why so many folks nowadays choose to look for video essays instead of straight up by the book reviews is that there's no need to recommend something solely based on whether it's marketable or not. Way too often the shit like objective critique gets chucked around as the one true thing to strive for, but I don't know, that feels kind of soulless to me. Like all critique or enjoyment of art, it's so subjective that it became this sort of meme term. Plus, I don't think I'd be able to stomach doing what I'd be doing if everything I said had to just be another bullet point on a list of criterias. I never want to have to rank something or quantify it to be able to tell you it's unique or inspiring or even just how it made me feel. And that applies to pretty much every vector of art forms. Similarly, I don't think you need to be a philosophy major to quote unquote get a piece of art. Too many people are needlessly antagonistic about folks who just want to vibe with something, calling them fake fans for not knowing as much, not getting it, as if the interpretation one has over another is better than anything else. To that, I say, fuck that noise. If you've played Hylix, if you've enjoyed any sort of outsider art, you should be able to talk about what you love without some weirdo on your ass about it. There's never been a penultimate right or wrong way to make art. Same goes for interpreting it, or even just looking at it. Which is why, when I hear folks whipping out the good ol', well, it's not a real game, to talk about something that's getting a little more out there with it, I kinda instinctively raise an eyebrow. Like, not only does it come off as hella reductive, but also, I don't think it ever really mattered in the grand scheme of things. We've gone too far to get caught up in things like whether or not games should cater to our understanding of interactive media as a whole. There's so many people trying to dictate the do's and don'ts of video game. And really, this feels so unnecessarily limiting for a medium like itself. Since, well, games have been and should be able to do whatever they want, however they want. There's no need to constrain the entire medium around some folks' preconceived expectations and demands if you're out there making stuff for yourself in the first place toying around and experimenting with all sorts of different ideas, structures, or genres. I always love when shit gets to be unapologetically itself, in every manner of weird ways. There's a certain rule of cool when it comes to shit like that. Like no matter how nonsensical a plot will get, or however cryptic an art style might look, as long as that shit slaps, or at least somehow manages to connect with me, I'm on board 100% of the way through. All that shit is stuff that would often connect to folks like Mason Lindroth, even if only superficially. Like the work of Takena, this Japanese claymation artist known for their wild and drastic style, always showcasing the coolest visuals in their gory love letters to classical horror movies. Or folks like Sonehati and their CGI efforts. You know the stuff that just screams Y2K. Vibrant colors, anime over-the-top goodness, and all sorts of stylish fonts overlapping each other. Though that's something for another vid. This melting pot of multiple art forms, the idea that all sorts of different disciplines and styles touch each other whether you see it or not, it's kind of what Mason Lindroth's own style exemplifies. Traditional art eventually morphs into claymation. Claymation in turn reshapes itself to computer-generated imagery, and so on and so forth. Whatever imperfections you might now see as those weird and obtuse things about your favorite artistic medium will eventually become their main defining factors. Uncomfortable looking pre-rendered graphics, obscured only by the compression necessary to fit it on a disc. The way so many styles of computer-generated art were used to convey the zeitgeist of their respective eras, each coming wave of CGI shining in its own unique way. The almost oily sheen of claymation, complete with its respective artist's fingerprints covering it, their presence proudly gracing their creation, forever intertwined with it. All of these will be loved and imitated as soon as the generation of folks who were melded by it will find their ways toward art. Those in turn becoming the next wave of transgressive artists who push the medium and our understanding of it one step further. The biggest common point between all of those works is that they were made by artists who looked at the world around them, their current cultural climate, respective eras, and chose to partake within that whole cycle of creation. A lot of those folks came from an era where the medium of video games was in its peak infancy. It didn't have a clear set in stone task list detailing what you could or couldn't put in games. So arguably, that stuff got to flourish in an open space, in the absence of set rules, which is most definitely why a lot of them came from backgrounds that were more adjacent than purely video game centric. Programmers, musicians, all manner of artists who would go on to create multimedia projects that wouldn't have to follow modern conventions 
because they just got to be themselves, completely unabashed and unrestrained. Hylix, in both games, manages to blast away those expectations, while still using familiar tropes. Because even though the former takes on that typical, well-known RPG format, it's how it used it to its full extent that truly made it shine. The toned-down, very casual gameplay serving to contextualize even more why it's such a good subversion of its own genre. Meanwhile, the latter uses those back-to-back -back and manages to surprise even more, in such a way that it legit makes both games act as the other's rightful half. Convention and subversion, style and substance. In all of its bizarre psychedelia and overall goodness, Hylix left me with only one more thing to say. To be an artist, or even to just appreciate art, is to be able to look at it from all sides, every angle, to appreciate it for how different it can be from person to person, and the way it touches, affects, or resonates with us. Because even the weird, the gross, the obtuse, as much as the cute and lovely stuff, it all has its place, even if you don't particularly fuck with it. And maybe in that, it'll help folks find the hidden beauty within that abstraction. Because all that inherent symbolism stemming from art like what I've presented today, it all ends up being like clay. It's what you choose to make out of it that truly matters. Oh.